you know, I did the research. I found out everyone dies. You know, and, uh, <laughs> so I wanted to highlight highlight the idea that we have to incorporate in our culture not only our success and how much money we make, but the impact that we have on others. The business is not a story of numbers, it's the number of stories. You are the product. And the fact of the matter is, is that you can go to multiple companies at this stage of the game. The real value added going forward in the future is going to be the importance of the relationships that you're able to create. So my guest today is Joseph W. Jordan, world-renowned international speaker in the topic of personal finance and insurance, spoken at Million Dollar Roundtables, spoken Thailand, Korea, Ireland, Greece, Poland, Taiwan, um, renowned independent speaker, an author, and behavioral finance expert. And I'm holding his book right now, The Life of Significance. He's spoken at a conference multiple times. We're looking forward to having him potentially speak at a future conference here in the short, near future. If anybody can talk to us about the history of life insurance and the power that this industry creates for the common Joe, you are looking at and you're watching the right interview. So, Mr. Joseph Jordan, welcome to the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. Well, thank you, Matt. And it's really a pleasure to be with you. I have been combing over these books the last few days to reread it again in preparation for this conversation. And I appreciate our conversation from last week. And I'm thinking to myself, not only are you going to be a potential speaker in a future conference down the road, as you had in the past, uh, but I'm also really delighted about the conversation you had with a mentor of yours, Mr. Bob Ben Moshe. Uh -huh. So I, I've got both of his books here. I've got uh, Life is Significance, Joseph, Joseph Jordan's book, and also got Good for the Money, Bob Ben Moshe. So I, I want to really go back to how you first got started in the insurance business, because a lot of people see you speak. A lot of people see you uh, as an author. But Joe, you're an insurance agent. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that start. Well, I, I'll tell you uh, uh, what happened was, uh, you know, I played football in college and I was a I was a Catholic big brother and I was on the board of the Catholic big brothers. And there was another guy, Tom Costello, who used to play linebacker for the Giants. And so uh, he said to me, you should be in the insurance business. Now, back then, that was my second religion. So you have to do what a New York giant tells you to do. <laughs> so that's that's all the mystery out of it. OK, it was just there. I do think God interceded in this um, because, as you know, or maybe people don't know, uh, my mother was widowed when I was very young. My dad was an advisor to Harry Truman when he was president. And uh, they had we had a residence in Washington, D.C., in the Bronx, in New York, and then also a summer home in Blue Point, Long Island. And one day he cashed in a hundred thousand dollar New York life policy to buy an apartment building. This is 1952 now. Wow. Okay? And he got killed in a car accident. And um uh, my mother woke up with four kids. I'm six months old, and my 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 oldest sister was 12, and there were two in between. She had a raises, so that was my life experience. You know, that's what I went through, and uh, and 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 uh, uh, when 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 Tom Costello told me to get into the the insurance business, I did. They had a college program. You would sell policies to college seniors. Uh, it was finance. You know, you put down ten dollars. The balance is. Uh, is in a loan and you pay back the loan and all this other. So that's how I got started. And uh, um, just doing that. And then um, what happened was it was going great until the summer came because there was no one on campus. See, I didn't understand what prospecting was, you know, okay. because I knew everybody and was there. And then I extended as a, as a, as a non-paid football assistant coach. So, so that's, that, that's how it got started. So that was the, uh, the whole impetus towards it. But um I do think God interceded because it found the thing that I do best and the thing that beyond financial success and what have you was the idea and the ability and the, and the knowledge and the wisdom, because that's when I came up with the book, Living a Life of Significance. I, 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 was, uh, I came from the dark side. I was about as dark as you could be, you know. Uh, I, left, I left the insurance because I was in the insurance in 1974. That's when the first gale, gas prices happened and inflation went through the roof. So the whole world turned upside down. So um, uh, you talk the dark side being the career shops. Not so much that. No, I just wanted to get the money, baby. You know, that's I, I what I was you. in okay. it for. You understand? <laughs> I wasn't living no life of significance. I was looking for dough. And uh, then I left and I went to Payne Weber. Well, you have a lot of young people on it. It's like a smaller Merrill Lynch, a warehouse right on Wall Street. OK, so that was a whole nother culture. OK. And so I was in the midst of that. 
and, um, and, and they were going in the insurance business, not so much to take care of customers, but it was more along the lines of diversifying revenue streams. All business, not that business is bad, don't get me wrong, okay. but that was it. Yep. And, uh, and that culture was a little rougher than the insurance business, you know. And then, um, so that's when I kind of came to the, so, so from that experience, and, uh, and then I lived through, there were a number of insurance companies that collapsed, Baldwin United and all this stuff like that. I went through real crucible, you know, yeah. and I was responsible. Imagine, imagine listening on the radio or, or television, Payne Weber said, and Payne Weber was me. And I had no idea what the hell was going on, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so that was it. But you know what? You know what that lesson learned taught me because these were people who bought annuities and they they closed the doors. They couldn't get it out. It taught me this because I had to go out and talk to these people, ready to kill me. And I what I learned from that was there's an old saying: Don't tell me about the return on my money. Tell me about the return of it. And when the insurance commission is blocked, you know, blocked the money, they said you're going to get your money in three years. You're going to get it at three percent, which is Pretty decent today, but back then, you know, you got to understand back in the early 80s, interest rates were like 18 percent. That's why they went, you know, crazy. So uh, that's that's the lesson I learned from that. Um, I, I thought I thought and I looked at it. I said financial services as a whole is not as client centric as other industries. And I thought there'd be issues and there, there were. Mm -hmm. I would say that Wall Street was pretty wicked along those lines, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, something has to change. So that's where I wrote Living a Life of Significance. I wanted to highlight, highlight the idea that we have to incorporate in our culture, not only our success and how much money we make, but the impact that we have on others. It's the only way, I think, to really feel satisfied and to have fulfillment in your life is to think that almost an extension of, of religion, if you would, mm -hmm. that was, was what I started doing. So that's where I focused in on less about the numbers the business is not a story of numbers. It's the number of stories. And not that you don't have to learn this stuff, but what happens is this. People don't get the numbers. They're testing you out, all right? There's a study done, and people they found out that people retain 6% of what you say and 100% of how you made them feel. Mm. And that's after they forgot 94% of what you said. So, <laughs> so, so, so I'm not saying you don't have to be prepared, but I was trying to change that change that uh, that the dial. So that was the reason behind the book so so back in the day and i'm i'm reading these books and i've, I've been in the insurance industry now since uh 98 99 so 23 years which is nothing compared to some of these uh, sages and veterans in the business but i'm i'm watching these shows uh for example father knows best right and then father was an insurance agent and right. then the shows today modern family right mm -hmm. then now dad is a real estate agent it seems like everybody's getting involved in the Real estate game, but back then everybody wanted to get involved in the insurance game. Why was the insurance industry such a hot industry to get involved in in the 40s, 50s, and 60s? And why was it like the golden era of recruitment and getting involved in the industry back back then with the Mets and the Prus and and, and and the the blue blood insurance companies? Well, that's a that's a good observation, and and I think uh, uh, um, you know a lot of the insurance companies began to put emphasis on distribution. So they would bring in agents and they would train them. And bear in mind the distribution, no one was independent. You either work for Equitable or you work for MetLife or you work for Pru, you know. Yeah. Um, but Met was really advanced, uh, you know, and, and it goes back to the, um, if you don't mind the history, sure. uh, it goes back Please. to the immigration days. You know, they, they were the first ones actually doing, you know, they'd have a Romanian guy stand by the Romanian boat when it came in. You know, so I'm being very simplistic on it. But, sure. you know, at the time you had all of these... Uh, you know, immigrants coming in and, and they had the uh, what was called debit policies. Yep. If you ever read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, you know, the guy would come by and collect the dime. And it was one of the best forms of marketing that was out there because the guy would show up and be in the room and realize the daughter's getting married and all this other stuff, you know. So that worked, you know, that, that worked for a while. And then um, uh, I, I, what happened was when we started to get into the late 60s, early 70s and the inflation took off like a rocket, a lot of those stayed things, you know, um, uh, like a twenty-five thousand dollar policy met significantly less in nineteen seventy-seven than it did in nineteen sixty-five. If you follow what I'm saying, I gotcha. And then what happened is, I think, uh, and I was part of this. Okay, I think what happened was uh, uh, 
people didn't like the idea. It's like the Woody Allen jokes, you know, they, they put me in solitary with an insurance guy salesman, you know, so those types of things started coming up. And so that's the way people were. And so there was this whole movement over to the idea of assets under management, the idea of being a fund manager, a money manager. And, um, uh, and I was part of that. I mean, cause I left, I've left the insurance company I was with and I went to Payne Weber because I want to be a cool guy on wall street. Sure. And then I found out wall street wasn't all that cool. You know? <laughs> um, and, 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 and so assets under management took over because people thought it was cool, something there. And they didn't want to have to ask those types of disturbing questions, you know, but I'll tell you this, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Okay. Sure. Cause I just got this and this is from uh, McKinsey. And so I know from whence I speak, cause I lived through it. Okay. So, Oh, and just as an example, when I got to MetLife, I was the first like outsider that made it, you know, it was a very, uh, it was a great company, but it was all inbred, you know, and no one really came from the outside. I was the first officer they hired that actually made it. it like, it, like, like outside, like a uh, groom from the inside in terms of insurance. That's agent. right. I wasn't, I wasn't a MetLife employee went up. If I was, I oh. would have been metrified. You know what I'm saying? Metrified. They, they, they got me from <laughs> Wall Street, but, but the reason I succeeded at Met was because I understood the insurance mentality. Okay. Yeah. You see, you have to understand this insurance. People were sort that were told to sell fear. You're going to die mm -hmm. and they're income gatherers and brokers. Okay. Are, are greed sellers. And they, 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 they're asset gatherers. You had very successful life insurance people who never asked someone for a hundred thousand dollars before. So you had to get them over that. Oh, so I'm talking, this is, these are cultural changes that are there. But I will tell you this, and this may not be so relevant today, but it's happening. This is from, from McKinsey, and I just got this. In the next 10 years, advisors will gradually shed their role as investment managers and become more like integrated life wealth coaches. And so wow. what's happened now is that all these products, because everyone differentiated by product design and stuff, that's what they were selling. Well, all of the products got kind of commoditized. And so what's coming out now, what's beginning to happen now is you are the product, you salespeople that are out there listening to this, you are the product. And the fact of the matter is, is that you can go to multiple companies at this stage of the game. The real value added going forward in the future, I know some of you are starting out and you're do, and doing the thing, so keep doing it. But in the future is going to be the importance of the relationships that you're able to create. And what's going to happen is the idea that we'll be less into the numbers and more like a life coach. Who else can, can get people through this? And there's one other oh. statistic that's important just to give you an idea. Okay. I'm killing you now, I know. But but um, this this just came. And I, both of these I just got yesterday, okay? This is from Elon Musk. And if, if you've heard me talk, I've always said that the biggest issue humanity faces going forward is the, is the aging population of the world. That's my thrust. It isn't global warming or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so he said this, he said, the biggest risk, he said, there's not enough people. And the biggest risk civilization faces is the low birth rate and the rapidly declining birth rate. Yet so many smart people think that there are too many people in the world and, uh, and they think the population is growing out of control. It's completely the opposite. If people don't have more children, civilization will crumble. So what am I telling you here? Okay, I'm telling you that you, all of you in this business are dealing with the major issue that humanity faces. And that is, as the population ages, the people lucky enough to be your clients perhaps will be the ones that will have independence and dignity in their old age. And that's the thrust that I'm getting across that's there. And I've watched it evolve all through those years. So I don't know if I gave you too much about it, but but that's that's what I'm laying on you. <laughs> Let, let's stay on technology here real quick. Uh, so so with the advent of technology, with the advent of robots, the advent of artificial intelligence, what's your opinion, Joe? Do you think that artificial intelligence will ever replace an insurance agent? No, I don't. I really don't. I, I think that the the, 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 the the virus we just had, you know, helped that out. You know, Yale did a study and found out the more people use Facebook, the worse they feel. <laughs> you know, nobody, nobody posts that the dog died or they had a lousy day at the office. It's all this idyllic crap that people don't, don't, right. you know, don't deal with it. You know, yeah. the fact of the matter is this, is that it accentuated more. There are things going on in this world that are bigger than, than uh, 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 that just that, that are outside of our business, but I think affects it. And I think that's one of them. Now I'm in favor of technology coming in and it's there. 
but what uh, but and and if more people get insured as they're supposed to do that way that's fine but i don't think it ever replaces it and you know you saw those commercials people turning into their parents you know as <laughs> right. people get older they can't do this on their own you know they just can't and as your business grows as you get in this business and you begin to grow and expand the capabilities that you have they're going to need your advice because here's the deal in my day everyone had a pension and, uh, uh, you know, saving for retirement was not such a big deal. Now it is. It's crucial. And it's yo-yo. You're on your own. On top of that, people are living a lot longer. So that, accent, that doesn't mean that they're all healthy. So that accentuates what happens to society of what he's talking about is we're going to spend a lot of resources trying to take care of older people than doing some other stuff. But, but I think this, this career is the key towards people having a significant impact on others and the whole world. Love it. I, I want to talk to a former company we're with, which is MetLife, and uh, the, their attempt to replacing the insurance. I'm going to show this picture here in a second, sure. but their attempt to replace the insurance agent was insurance kiosks at Walmart. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. And this was a mess. This this turned into a two million dollar mess. Right. And to make a long story short, MetLife, which was regarded is one of the larger population of insurance agents in the marketplace eventually sold their agents right. to Mass Mutual. Did, it, did this shock you when they, this happened in 2016? Yeah, that was a real tragedy. What happened was the company after Bob, and I know we'll talk about him, mm -hmm. that took it over were finance guys. And so they despised the field force. They thought it was expensive. They thought it wasn't as productive as it could be. And they destroyed a franchise that you could never replace that went back to the 1860s and they sold it for a song. And what they thought at the time was once we do this and we'll get rid of all of this expense, then what will happen is, um, you know, the stock will go through the roof. And the stock didn't. In fact, Prue and Met were kind of the same size, went kind of public kind of around the same time. And Prue's stock was up to 100 and Met stayed around 45. So they failed in that endeavor. Wow. Um, I don't I don't dismount, you know, our companies have to deal with technology and stuff and experiment with it. But I, I knew some of those things but early on. The institutional side of Met wanted to set up these kiosks so people in the hospital could go up and see their benefits. They had to hire someone to stand next to the kiosk to tell somebody <laughs> to, this is the kiosk and this is what it does. Now, I'm not saying that'll be forever, but I don't think technology is a threat. I think it's a it's a help. And, you know, look at this call we're doing now. Do you ever think in a million years I would have learned how to do this Zoom crap? Not on your life. Not on your life. All right. And and that's that's what I think this technology did. So I I, I don't view technology as a threat. I view it as an enabler. We're, we're, we're looking at the Star Wars days here, Joe. This is Star Wars, you know. Beat me up, Scotty. Um, I want to talk about the evolution of the insurance industry because you know, Wall Street's, Wall Street's got its movies, right? You got Wall Street, you got the Wolf of Wall Street. There's so many movies yeah. about Wall Street. There's so many movies about business people. I don't see any movies about the nobility and help and significance of what an insurance agent does in the, in the community. I mean, I'm just looking at my little business right now, Joe. I'm looking at my, when I, when I first started in my career, I would probably sell at most, and, and Joe, you probably laugh at me at these numbers, but at most, I would sell about 100 clients a year, okay, uh, of, of permanent life insurance policies, annuities, term life insurance bundled all together, about 100, 120 at max, buying leads, doing the, these type of things. But since I decided to build an insurance agency, last year, we sold 25,000 policies instead wow. of my 100 individually. So what, what I'm thinking is, I'm, I'm like amazed at what skill does to the typical insurance agent that's able to to think differently than just an agent, think more like an agency builder or entrepreneur. Have you seen that more apparent inside the insurance industry where insurance agents today have to think like a business person versus just a, just a, you know, one off policy and just a private practitioner? Yeah, they, they have to think more like a business person. I think that's right. And, and the ability to, to grow an agency, you know, like you do it to, to, to gain revenues from other people's activities is also important. The other thing that I think is really great about that model, your particular model, is the fact that you're 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 a financial services wet dream. You know, you're all young, <laughs> you're you're all ethnically diverse, and and they wish they could do it. And and on top of that, for the most part, you serve a market that is woefully underserved, yep. and you talk to a lot of people who may never be rich, but they don't deserve to be poor.
And it's my favorite line of yours. Uh, can you say that one? I, I love it when you say that on, on stage. They, one more time. They don't. One more time. They don't. Uh, that people may never be rich, but they don't deserve to be poor. And you should be very proud of that, because what's happened is the insurance business started tailing off and dealing with wealthy guys, you know, yep. uh, wealthy folks and whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and not that you feel folks shouldn't evolve towards that. But that's where you, and and your types of your types of organizations are the only place where there's growth going on in the insurance business relative towards towards salespeople. And uh, that will see it. I, I do think that the wealth management stuff will start to see its day. You know, let, uh, let me put it to you this way. OK, okay. no, but assets under management's a tough gig. People feel losses twice as much as they feel gains. No matter how good you do, there's always someone that, you know, my guy across the street got 12.4, you know, sure. and you have to put up with that. OK. Nobody on their deathbed says, call my broker. I really appreciate she beat the S&P by six basis points. OK, it just doesn't happen. You know, it just isn't there. But pay a death claim or a disability yeah. claim or put people back on their feet. It's a completely different thing. And that's yeah. why uh, um, that, that that's one of the things that I, I talk about. Um. I want to shift. I want to shift gears to uh, your relationship at, at MetLife and running across uh, Mr. Bob Ben Moshe, sure. which I believe is an American turn on business story. That is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, turn on business stories in American business that has not been told, no. and I'm shocked that it hasn't been told. And I'm talking about the 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 the, the book here, Good for the Money. You you work together with him. Tell me about when you first ran across this gentleman, Bob Ben Moshe at Met. I was I, I worked with Bob at, at Payne Weber. OK, oh, Payne Weber, OK, Bob, Bob, you know, just to give you a perspective, because I, I think it's good for people to get a historical view. Um, Merrill Lynch in the 80s came up with a thing called the CMA account, and it was an account where people could. Uh, some guys said people buy stock, they use a check. Let's be the checkbook. It wasn't deep, but hard. But no one thought culturally stockbrokers would do it because they weren't getting paid for it. Well, it took off like a rocket. So what happened was the president of Payne Weber knew he couldn't use a systems guy from a wirehouse to build a banking product. Bob was with Chase at the time, Chase Manhattan Bank. So we brought Bob in. Bob did that. So Bob made it, you know, had, it was a great success. And then he was he wanted to do more. So he took over a couple of, you know, you got to understand is the insurance department of Payne Weber was not really the crucible, of, you know, of, of Payne Weber's, you know, marketing prowess. So we took us a few of us over and, and he, he was just unbelievable. He, uh, he, 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 he began a systems background, a thirst for knowledge, could learn quick, turn on a dime and always did the right thing. And so I finally left MetLife, Payne, uh, Payne Weber and I went to Met and I was there and they knew us because we did a lot of business with, uh, with MetLife. And uh, then there was some internal turmoil going on at Met and uh, the guy who was president at the time was a lawyer. He didn't know how to deal with it. So he was asking me about Bob. So I said, yeah, bring Bob over. You know. So I called Bob. I said, Bob, you got to come over. He said, do what, you know? And uh, well, yeah, I think this is a good part of the story. Bob, Bob was Jewish and there weren't a lot of Jews, you know, on Wall Street. So despite having doing tremendous things, there was that stuff going on, you know? Sure. And, gotcha. and, 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 and so um, he wound up going over to Met and, uh, 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 he, he, he loved the place. He took it over. And, uh, he was, he was the first time that I met someone in a corporate life who always did the right thing for the right reason and courageous and, yeah. and, and always smart and always doing the right thing. Yeah. Uh, take us through this scenario, uh, Joe, where in 2008 at the peak of the financial crisis, AIG was, was sinking fast and make a long story short, they basically borrowed 183 182.3 billion dollars from the U.S. government. Right. Okay, and take us through that scenario because I don't want to kill the punchline. And uh, talk to us where Bob Ben Moshe was at at that time. Yeah, well, what happened is he took MetLife public and then he retired, and then AIG came after him because of the crisis, you know, that was going on. And you know, usually, you know, a financial crisis, people were buying houses they couldn't afford because uh, they lowered the standards dramatically. And of course, if you if you said something about not not lowering the standards, you were a racist, you know, it was that type of stuff, you know. The one, <laughs> so the, the real estate thing just totally exploded. Yeah. And uh, so they were after Bob. So um, 
the, the, the prior CEO of AIG. Now, bear in mind, AIG is a huge company. OK. Yeah. And the reason they had to bail them out, it wasn't just a Wall Street firm. This thing had pensions and property and casualty insurance. This this downfall would have been dramatic. Catastrophic. And what a lot like of people. Yep. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know AIG started in China. Um, it's an international company and it's tr crown jewels of distribution in the insurance business. We're all in Asia and, and South America too. So Bob, Bob came in. And so this is the idea of the character and leadership. And, you know, I got to tell you, your fearless leader, uh, gives me a lot of vibes that I was picking up from Bob, you know, wow. from Patrick, Patrick David. Oh, <laughs> so, so anyway, um, uh, Bob, Bob goes in and, uh, he said, and, and the, the prior, he was, already he, he, was well, he was in Europe when he got the call. Right. So he was retired overseas. Yeah. He, yeah he was retired. He was in the, Bra he was in, uh, in Croatia. Croatia. That's where he bought his, his Dacia. I was with him when we, we, we went, did that. And so, uh, anyway, uh, he said, because all you have to do is go over the Adriatic to Italy and it's four times as expensive. So he's also <laughs> very frugal. So, um, so, um, uh, uh, anyway, uh, he said, OK, I'll step up and I'll do this thing. So you got to understand at this time, if you worked for AIG, people were burning crosses on your lawn. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was it was bad. And so Bob came in and he went and he told all of the employees, you know, the other guy was just a punching bag for the for the, for the Congress and, uh, and and everyone. Would, you know, so Bob, Bob just wouldn't tolerate that. And he told the people, you are the you're the reason this organization worked. You're great. And he and unbelievable under unbelievable circumstances he held everyone he also lashed out and made sure that they knew that he made sure that they knew it's like patrick that he had their back and so he went in and saw uh oh i can't the guy was running the treasury at the time a geitner says, oh, what's that was a geitner yeah geitner right yep. he says the geitner you know who the f are you to tell me i can't pay my people so the first time he sees him two inches from his face and geitner's sitting there going like who the hell is this guy you know it's like uh Sundance kid, you know, who is that guy? Lord Baltimore following him, you know, every time he was there. So he was, he was like that. And he made certain that the employees knew that he had their back. And um, what he did was he first day he went in, they were breaking the company apart. He fired all of them who were doing that. And he says, we're not, we're not selling anything because he knew there was intrinsic value in all of those companies, you know? And uh, so he wanted to sit on it to let the prices go up. And, um, uh, the government did bail it out because they figured there'd be a crisis if it wasn't. And uh, they were get a kick out of this. Elizabeth Warren, okay, this is before she was a senator, was running. They had all of these uh, staffers, you know, um, uh, uh, asking questions. So Bob was through a thing saying, we really appreciate the government stepping in. And our plan is to pay the government back. So one guy asked very respectfully, said, Mr. Ben Moshe, we gave you $186 billion. I mean, you you plan on paying it back 10 billion, 5 billion. He says, no, I'm going to pay it all back plus a profit, 86 billion. So um, some guy there from, from the, uh, the, the automotive uh, union. Industry, yeah. Yeah. He said, uh, Mr. Ben Moshe, so-and-so from S and P says you can't do that. So Bob's like, I don't know who this guy is. He doesn't know my company. I'm going to tell you, I want you to write it down. So you get it. This is in Congress, right? You know, now, why wouldn't you follow this guy through the hells of gate, you know, the gates of hell? So uh, he said, I'm going to do it. And he did it. What he did was by waiting, the prices went up and he was able to sell all of those companies that were internationally, you know, in China and everything. Uh -huh. He was able to pay the government back plus a $20 billion profit. And you don't hear a thing about it. Right. You don't hear a thing about it. Why is that, though? That's that's money. back. So in other words, America, the taxpayers benefited from yes. borrowing money, I, I think what there was a trap too in terms of equity of, of AIG to, to securitize and collateralize the yeah. debt repayment, right? So right, they, right. they'd give certain stock of the companies. I mean, it was a big amount. It's like 70, 80% of AIG yeah. to collateralize the loan. And then Bob pays his money back. And, and how many years later would, did he pay it back? In three years. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it was a very short period of time. You know, this was major stuff. And then towards the Towards near the end of it, he got cancer. So he's doing this on chemotherapy, you know? So, you know, you can imagine the guy. One, one, one great story I have to tell you, they found when they first got Bob, that he, they felt he was so abrasive to Congress that they put someone in the middle, okay? And they, so Bob was president and CEO. They bring in this guy from American Express, I can't remember his name. And he was, he was chairman, but, see, but not CEO Bob was. So they're about to sell AI, AIA, which is in China, and that's the crown jewel. And they're going to sell it to Pru, 
uh, UK. And um, uh, at the last minute, the guy says, 35 billion, okay? It was gonna go for 18, 35. So he says, how about 30? Because my board can't take it. So Bob says, okay. So the chairman back in New York queers the deal. So Bob, this is a movie. It's a movie. This, this like didn't happen, okay? He goes in, it's, it's the OK Corral, you know, do, you know, gunfight in the OK Corral. At noon. He walks into the board and says, the, the chairman over here acts more like a boss than a partner. So it's either him or me. What are you going to do when he walks out? And, and so that, <laughs> that's just the type of character the guy was. And they had to get rid of the other guy because Bob owned the employees. But he always did the right thing. He made sure certain that they had their back. And I have to tell you, that's some of the stuff I get. I, 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 I get a sensation with Patrick. So that's my fault. If there was ever a guy who deserves, this is the seventh anniversary of his death. I think it was early, early March, I think it was. And, um, um, but it, 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 it's a great experience to see somebody like that, that at that high level still operated under the pretense in terms of what was the, what was the right thing to do. Powerful. I, I remember that was our, convention night, our first convention at PHP, and Patrick had mentioned that on stage because yeah. PHP at that time was the number one writer in the country for AIG Index Universal Life Policies. Yeah. And he announced on stage that uh, uh, Bob Ben Moshe passed away. I didn't know who he was. And here we are in the insurance scene. I, I didn't know who he was until he mentioned and we became part of this story. And, and you know, Patrick is his historian. He's always talking about capitalism, always talking about entrepreneurship. He said, you need to get to know who this guy is. And, yeah. and uh, just a just an amazing story. I, I I hope this story makes it to a movie one day. It deserves to be heard. Well, my my nephew is a is a producer with a, a, one of these things out in Hollywood. I was trying to sell him on the idea, but it's just too good a story. You know, it's it's usually got to be bad. You know what I mean? And uh, and uh, uh, it, it it really is in the twentieth century, perhaps the biggest. Uh, you know, uh, well, twenty first, obviously. Uh, the, the, the biggest rebound. No one, no one, no one would ever think that AIG could come back from that. You know, right? And, Huge. Uh, and uh, he—that's just a remarkable guy. It's one of the good things about this business. You get to meet remarkable people like yourself, and uh, and, uh, and and Patrick. You know, because I don't think uh, any other other what the tarp the, the the tarp money that was lent out to the banks. I don't think none of these banks have paid back. No, they didn't. American That's why the guy, the guy from the guy from the, the, the auto union, GM never paid it back. Yeah, right. He paid it back plus a profit for crying out loud, you know. And so he was in New York magazine saying, where's, you know, you know, where's my thank you? Yeah. So exactly. uh, but 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 that but that's the point, I think, which is that the lesson to me and to others on a personal basis is 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 focusing on doing the right thing. And, uh, and good things happen, you'll be remembered. Awesome. So if for those of you reading, our book readers, make sure you not only purchase Mr. Joe Jordan's book, Life of Signific Living a, a Life of Significance, but also this story we're talking about here, the greatest turnaround in American business history, at least in the 21st century, Mr. Bob Ben Moshe. Uh, I, I've had I'm, in, I'm in Bob's book, too. You, 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 I'm in it. You know, I got you know, a set. <laughs> you made a set. It's awesome, man. We got to check it out. Um, Speaking, speaking of Bob, uh, speaking of Bob, you also if have in your book, not only have you mentioned Bob in your book, but there's another guy here that you mentioned, which I recommend to all of our brand new guys who begin their career in the insurance business is read this book uh, called The Game of Numbers by Mr. Nick Murray. What's your relationship with Mr. Nick Murray? Well, I started I, I started fee based planning at MetLife, you know, part of the evolution, you know, was the idea for slowly what was happening is getting out of just product sales and then into getting to understand clients. And so that's what what fee based financial planning was all about. And I didn't know that much about it. So I heard this guy, Nick Murray, really knows a lot about it. So I figured when he was going to go up and talk and do stuff, I'd hear a lot of charts, graphs and numbers. Didn't mention a thing. Yeah, it was all about what he talked was behavior. And so what he said that the reason that people fail as investors is because they behave badly. In fact, if people behave badly, they not only underperform the market, they underperform the very investments they're in. Because without someone sitting there, so you see, remember I told you, it's not about the math, okay? It's about the consequences of the decisions. And it's not a story of numbers, it's the number of stories, because the numbers always will. But the fact of the matter is the way people behave when they panic out, and there's no one there to keep them in. That's that's the whole idea behind fees. Everyone complains, oh, you're ripping us off. You know, you got fees and all of this other stuff. Yeah. 
The fact of the matter is a well-timed intervention can be worth a decade's worth of fees. Because when someone was sitting there in 2008 and it was down 57%, and someone says, I'm about to tear my hair out and I gotta get out of this thing, the three big most important words you have to learn is to say, don't do that, okay? And, and if they, that happens, it's there. So that's, that's kind of where it starts to happen as you start getting into more, more of these investment type things is that's, where, that's why it's evolving more towards a counselor type of approach. And that's, that's ultimately all of the agents who are on this or people thinking about joining this business. That's the opportunity that you have. And you know what? Very rarely, there are a lot more people than there are agents that can service them. So supply and demand says what? Okay, so that's why this is a great profession to get in. And it's only going to get better because, uh, and, and, and you guys are the feeders for that. You know, you've been around the block many times. Uh, Joe, you both, you've done both fee-based, you've done both commission. Right. Uh, do you have a preference of which one is, is, is best? I, I guess it's context or perspective, but should people charge more fees or are people just okay with paying a commission? I think, I think you can do both. I think you can charge a fee and also, you know, gain commissions, you know, commissions aren't bad in of themselves. That's the whole point. In fact, if someone's just strictly commissions, the fact of the matter is fee based is more expensive over time, you know, because as the assets grow, it, you know, uh, it goes you that pay, way. You have to pay more fees. Right. Yeah. And so look, I, I whatever, whatever floats your boat or how you want to do it is there. The only thing that I get is when some people get sanctimonious about it, you know, and, uh, and they, I'll, I'll give you an example. What happens is some of these fee only people, not all of them, okay? I don't want to get painted at this, but there's some people who are fee only. They will not do immediate annuities, which is in the client's best interest because it doesn't pay them their trailer. So they, they, you know, they wind up into the same, the same category. So I, I, think, I, 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 I think the model is in a, in a I hope, I hope you know, Congress doesn't screw it up or the SEC, you know, because they went after us with that DOL thing they, they really didn't know what they were doing right. and the here's the point you've, you've got an aging population you've got people living longer than they ever have before look in the old days people retired at 65 they took a boat to ireland came home and died so it was no big deal you yeah. know now what happens is they're living into their 90s so how is that going to happen we have to encourage more people in this field and 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 that's what you heard from elon right Elon saying this is the biggest issue that we face. At least you could know that your clients will be in a position so that they can be self-sustaining, have independence and dignity in retirement. Um, I want to talk about uh, prospecting and uh, just new people getting started in the business. And back to Nick Murray again, you know, his book, Game of Numbers. And I, and uh, unlike yourself, I, I message him to see if he can get an interview. He, he doesn't do interviews. He just does response emails. So, <laughs> but uh, I, I would so love Nick to get your... Do. Right. I'd like to get your opinion uh, on some of his responses here because I asked him, uh, I'd love to interview you based on your book in terms of prospecting and, and success and failure in our industry. He says, there's, there's a few things that I want you to get for the enthusiasm of my book. Number one, the last thing in the world I want for you to is get pumped up about my book. Don't get fired. Don't get pumped up. Pumped up is a drug and it wears off. Rather, I would hope the book gives you permanent and powerful sense how desperately ordinary people need your financial guidance and insurance advice and how immense is your power to help them and to do well by doing good. Right. Well, what's, what's your, what's your, I, I, there's two more other points here, but I, I love to know because you always talk about the insurance agent doing well in the industry because right. of, of the nobility of what we do for families. Well, that, but also I would tell you this is that uh, uh, the business is built on two premises. Okay. Two foundations, prospecting, and everything else, okay? And, and that's, that's not a joke, it's real. And that's what his book brings out. What, what happened to me was I, in, 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 working for Home Life, my boss gave me this thing, the Daily Contact Commitment, DCC. Yep. And I, he told me I had to ask X number of people a day to see me. And uh, this was back, you know, before emails and you know, those old phone stuff. And, or, or you could walk in and see someone. So mine was 10. I had to ask 10 people a day to see me and I had to ask them I had, you know, it's not a, not just a dial, you know, it's, you know, how to do it. So I was doing that. And so what I, what I, what I learned from that was you're managing to effort and not results. Nice. 
I you're see. managing to effort yeah. and not results. You don't control your results. You don't control whether someone sees you, buys from you, or whatever. I'm talking about in the isolated thing. It's just a question of continually prospect. Continually prospect. You'll succeed. You stop, you fail. And I don't care if you get a PhD and whatever, you're going to fail because it's there. So that that's that 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 really is the essence and the core essence of the business. My thought. So that's where when I saw he did the game of numbers. I bought like 600 of them at MetLife. Get it out to all of the managers, you know, yep. and uh, and and that I, I I think is the key. So I would recommend highly that people buy his book, the, the Game of Numbers. You can only get it get it through Nick Murray and his website, but that's how practical he is, you know. And and he also gives you words. He also gives you uh, context and. Um, uh, so any any form of the thing that works for me, I do it to this day is a daily contact commitment, you know, because you get it done, you know, and you, you have to work on it. You have to make certain the night before you write down who you're going to call because you won't do it. You you know what it's like, right? You know, today I'm going to make my calls. Oh, yeah. well, there's something here from and I'll read this and there's something in the Wall Street Journal. It's time for lunch. And then yeah. there's a there's a there's a word for it. it's called farting around. You know, <laughs> you don't get around to doing it. And so once you do it, look, and here's the point. If I had 10 no's, I had a successful day because I, 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 I put forward my effort and I didn't block it. And you can find really a lot of convenient ways to do that. So I think that's a, that's a mandatory book for anyone to, to sit down and read is the, the game of numbers. 100%. Uh, you know, Joe, you, you've been around the block. You've, been, you've seen up economy, down economy. You've seen our country go through war. You've seen our country go through high inflationary periods. Now twice, three right. times, you know, multiple times. You've seen bailouts, you've seen bankruptcies, you've seen the great Lehman Brothers, the Bear Stearns crumble uh, throughout this uh, recession, uh, the Great Recession, 08, 09. Why does, because I'm thinking to myself, why does the insurance industry continue to show its strength? Because the reason why I'm asking that is because when I first started insurance in 98, 99, everybody was getting involved in real estate. Yeah. And I almost got talked out of the insurance industry to get in with my buddies in real estate. And I, I, I've seen my buddies, you know, crash and burn in real estate multiple times when the market dumps. And I've just stayed consistent throughout uh, times. Why does the insurance industry continue to show its strength? Or, well, or I think I think what it does is it, 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 it really solves real basic fundamental human needs. You know, it's the idea of taking risk away. We all have risk, risk of dying too soon, risk of living too long, risk of market volatility, disrupting our, our income stream, risk of being fired you know, risk of becoming sick or disabled. Those are all risks that you can put off to someone else. So why wouldn't you do that? There's intrinsic value that is built into it. You know, annuities, which was the first part was, you know, those were before Christ was born, you know, so, so something that's sure. a couple of thousand, thousand yeah, It's years. not a joke. It was, it was invented by the uh, Roman army. Yeah, uh, it was yeah. called the Nuatatum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, so, um, Things that last centuries, okay, tend to, or millennial, okay, tend to have intrinsic value that's associated with it. And um, you know, I did the research. I found out everyone dies. You know, and, uh, <laughs> it's just it's just really a really a question of when. And look, that's that's what highlights my story. What were the odds of my father at 39 years of age with a successful career dying? Pretty small, but it happened. You know. And that's why it's not about the math. It's about the consequences of the decision. And too much of our business got left brain and analytical and they're looking at the numbers and they say, yeah, the fact of the matter is what happens if it's down to you from an individual perspective? You probably could be the most important person in someone's life. The ability for them to have something to recover and to make certain that the family stays intact. And uh, um, look, people buy insurance for one of three reasons. They either, uh, they either love somebody, they owe someone money, or well, they have a, 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 a something they want to give money to, a charity or something like that. Those are the three reasons towards doing that. And, um, and that's why, you know, that will continue. It's a great social good. It keeps people off of the welfare rolls, you know, when that happens. And um, uh, also the fact of the matter is most of the liabilities tend to be very long, which allows them to invest in a certain way, which gets them through some of those. I mean, sometimes you get caught, sometimes, you know, you, you get caught, but, but, but allows them, allows them to do that. So uh, I, I think, I think as Nick Murray says, you know, you want to, do, you know, you want to do good. You want to do well by doing good and you want to be happy doing well by doing good. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, 
that's that's what I think of the business. One last question uh, before I let you go is I think your alarms are going off. You got an appointment coming up. Yeah, but, I do. Uh, but, but Joe, um, you know, we've seen the company, the country go through uh, a correction in the market. You, you, in the Great Recession, we were talking about AIG earlier. Right. That company was potentially going to go in bankruptcy, going to fall, going to receivership, you name it. Right. But why has the insurance industry been able to maintain its strength throughout the length of the United States of America's history to be such a solid uh, a, a financial foundation for building a financial home? Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, they tended to be conservative. Again, as I said, long liabilities. Um, uh, you know, there, there have been some mavericks that have, you know, created, um, created, created some problems. And there were some companies that, that went down. But for the most part, not. You know, they had to really bail out the banks big time. They weren't doing that in the insurance industry, you know. Um, uh, and and uh, um, uh, I, I, I think it's a great industry and I think it does a great good and it helps society. Notwithstanding the liabilities that it takes upon, it becomes money centers. And so these big money centers, I don't know if you know this, do you know, you know what the largest corporation in the world was in 1936? I don't. It was MetLife. Wow. And the biggest lender to the federal government during World War II was MetLife. So I'm just using MetLife as an example. So then you become, you get these big money center groups. And then what they are able to do with is to invest into the, invest into the, uh, into their, their, their country infrastructure or all that stuff like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a it's a win win, and I think the long liabilities are one of the things that really helps it versus you know banks and what have. You. Yep, and still to this day, in your neck of the woods, the New York Giants and the New York Jets are still playing a MetLife Stadium. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, that being said, Joe, I thank you. It's so gracious with your time. And by the way, for those of you watching this, would you love to see Mr. Joseph Jordan at a conference at PHB? Would you love to see him at a conference that we do and host and bring him in as a speaker to teach you on how. You can have a life living, a life of significance, and uh, consider this insurance industry, consider the products and services that this insurance industry has. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for being a great ambassador to our insurance industry. And make sure we put all the links here below to make sure you connect with Mr. Joseph Jordan's website, books, and his work as he speaks around the world, crusading our message of this great industry. So that being said, uh, Joe, thanks so much for being part of the Seven Fear Squad interview thank series. You. Thank you very much. And for those of you watching this, I'd love to know your thoughts, your questions, your comments. Put it in the comment section below. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click like, hit subscribe, and hit notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. On behalf of Mr. Joseph Jordan, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye.